All right, everybody, our next topic is John F. Kennedy and the New Frontier. Uh, there's going to be a couple of videos that we're going to watch here. This is really good stuff. JFK is one of my favorite presidents. So uh, we're, we're going to get this started with the 1960 election. In 1960, we are in the midst of an economic recession. Just as we've come out of World War I, we now have come out of World War II, and it takes a little bit of time uh, in about 10 years for us to feel that recession uh, after that wartime production. So there's three main events that are going to shape the 1960 presidential campaign. The launch of Sputnik, the U-2 incident, and what's going on in Cuba with Castro coming to power and what's going to happen there with their connection to the Soviet Union. The candidates, JFK and uh, Richard Nixon, they have very similar positions on policy. So there's only a couple things that are going to really set them apart. Uh, Kennedy being Catholic, uh, the fact that this is the very first televised debate, and Kennedy's position on civil rights. Uh, this is really going to be the big standing out point. Uh, as far as him being Catholic, a lot of the people were thinking that he was going to be influenced by the Pope, and, they, and a lot of Americans weren't sure how they felt about that. Kennedy does promise active leadership here, which is something a little bit new. Vice President Nixon is hoping to ride Eisenhower's coattails, meaning that the country has voted Republican for the last two terms. He's hoping that they will continue to vote Republican and, and elect him to the presidency. The debate itself, there are four uh, presidential debates in 1960. The one that is going to be known as the Kennedy-Nixon debates is really talking about the very, very first debate. This is the very first televised debate ever. 70 million people watched the debate. Uh, it, it is incredible. Uh, a lot of people feel differently whether they watched it on TV or they listened to it on the radio. So uh, take a look at this. Richard Nixon was the favorite to win the Republican presidential nomination in 1960. Just 14 years after he was tapped by a group of small town businessmen to run for Congress in California, Richard Nixon stood at the top of his party. As he mapped out an ambitious 50-state campaign, he was challenged by his opponent, John F. Kennedy, to a series of televised debates, the first in American history. Even when hospitalized for two weeks with a knee injury, Nixon remained confident, anxious for the debates to begin, eager once again to use television to talk directly to the voters. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. According to rules set by the candidates themselves, each man... The Nixon-Kennedy debates would forever change the way Americans chose their presidents. Political rallies and old-fashioned handshaking became much less important than the image on the television screen. You must understand that Nixon himself had said, I don't want any makeup on for this, these particular debates. What I tried to explain to Dick was he has a certain characteristics of his skin where it's almost transparent. And it was a very nice thought to say, uh, you know, I don't want any makeup, but that he really needed it in order to have what we would call even an acceptable television picture. And, of course, JFK, here he'd been riding in motorcades all over California with the top down. He looked like a bronze warrior when he came into Chicago. He really did. I know what it means to see people who are unemployed. I know Senator Kennedy feels as deeply about these problems as I do. But our disagreement is not about the goals for America, but only about the means to reach those goals. The first debate was costly to Nixon. The radio audience thought he had won, but the largest television audience in history had seen the vice president haggard and drawn, and had been given its first sustained look at the Kennedy style. So the biggest thing with JFK is that he looked the part. He had the, he was young, he had the tan, he was out here in California for two weeks riding around in the motorcade like they said. Nixon had come off knee surgery, he was you know, lost a bunch of weight, eating a bunch, uh, eating hospital food, and he didn't look great at all on television. Those lights uh, can make it about 120, 130 degrees at some point. So he started to sweat. Um, he just didn't look real good. However, he sounded really good. He was very well, uh, well versed politically. But 70 million people saw Kennedy look better. So this right here is the map of the 1960 election. You can see Kennedy, he does win the electoral votes pretty handily by about 80, but look at the popular vote uh, by really 100,000 votes. So what we're going to have here coming up is the, f the simple fact that Kennedy doesn't really stand out very much. He doesn't have a whole lot of backing. It's very much split between Republicans and Democrats. Just one, a very 
close election, one of the closest in U.S. history. And he was aiming to unite the country. And so he deliberately... So take a look at his inauguration video. So help me God. So take a look at part of his inauguration video. So help me God. He just won a very close election, one of the closest in U.S. history. And he was aiming to unite the country. And so he deliberately avoided any topics that would that he felt were divisive. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. Early on in the planning stages, where he did include some issues on the domestic agenda, he decided to cut them out because he said it sounded too much like a campaign speech. The families without a decent home, the parents of children without a decent school, they all know that it's time for change. It's a collaboration, like um, many of um, JFK's speeches were. There's a page that shows, it's in Ted Sorensen's hand. They worked very closely together. The notes are a little bit hard to read, but it has some of Kennedy's instructions. Eliminate all the eyes. Let's just talk about what we can do. Add style and eloquence. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. JFK was determined to keep his speech short. And so when he first started working on the speech, he asked Sorensen to count up the words of some of the more notable ones. At one point, he said, I don't want, I don't want people to think I'm a windbag. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Ask not, it's a signature phrase of the speech. and. In it is really distilled an idea that had been his for months and years. You see that kind of language throughout many of his campaign speeches. The new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. The new frontier is not what I promise I'm going to do for you. The new frontier is what I ask you to do for our country. I really like the reading copy of the speech. It was ready for him to study just a day or two before the inauguration. And he had it with him almost all the time. And he made about 30 or 31 slight changes to the text, even while he was up there delivering really the speech of his life. In the reading copy, it says, ask not what your country will do for you, but he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And it's just that much sharper. He was speaking in the midst of the Cold War. They were grim times. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, he faced them, and at the same time, he was able to do it in a way that lifted the spirits of people. So I think there is greatness in that. Let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. So, once Kennedy gets elected, what he's going to do is form something very much like uh, FDR did with his brain trust. And what this is going to be called is JFK's best and brightest. This is his team of advisors. He's going to have a dean from Harvard, the president of Ford Motor Company, and also the secretary of defense. They want him to deficit spin. They want him to be like FDR and get the country back on track uh, during this recession that we're going to be, uh, that, we're, that we've been in. And JFK is going to rely heavily on his brother, Bobby Kennedy, who is going to be uh, basically the elected the attorney general. 
So, Camelot, very quickly here. The inauguration speech talks of this new generation. JFK, great speaker from Massachusetts. Uh, he is going to really set the bar for the good-looking young president. Uh, his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, has the style and the beauty and the poise. Uh, very young lady. I mean, Kennedy is the youngest elected president. Uh, he's almost the youngest to ever serve as president, right behind Teddy Roosevelt. He's only 43. The public relations with JFK is unlike any other. He's witty, he's very charming, he has very good relations, relationship with the press, and he looked good on TV above all else. I mean, that does a lot for those 70 million people to vote for him, uh, to, uh, to see him in that first uh, election, or that first debate. And really, that debate is going to set presidential debates back a good 10 to 15 years because no one else wants to debate on television after seeing that. Because he just looks the part. He has that mystique about him. He is going to uh, create the Peace Corps, which is the volunteer overseas. And this is going to be one of his signature programs as uh, coming from his presidency. And lastly, he wants to get us onto the moon. He's going to make a statement. He wants to get us on the moon by the end of the 1960s, and we almost missed that. It was, the, it was 1969 before we were able to put a man on the moon. And here he is again uh, with a couple young guys uh, with the um, Peace Corps. So his new frontier that he was speaking of is the metaphor for the domestic programs and more so the expansion of science in the space industry. Uh, he also wants to expand medical care and rebuild urban areas and aid uh, ed education. He also takes on poverty because he sees the level of unhealthiness that is going on. Uh, 50 million people within our United States at this point are living on less than $1,000 per person, which is way below the poverty line even for 1960. He, again creates that staff of the best and the brightest to start addressing these problems, science and space, medical care, urban areas, education, and poverty. There is some resistance. I mean, look back at that map. They're very even between the Republicans and Democrats in this 1960 election. There are conservative Southern Democrats, also known as Dixiecrats, that do not like JFK's civil rights agenda and do not like Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy is going to play an instrumental role in, in getting uh, Martin Luther King out of jail uh, during this election campaign. And these Southern Democrats are just not uh, ready for this. They're not ready for change, uh, not ready for the civil rights movement. And this is going to be right in the middle of the civil rights movement from 1954 to really 1967. And again, other Republicans do not want government spending on domestic issues. Uh, they really want to stop this, the ex excess government spending and, again, no deficit spending. And this all really comes down to the fact that JFK does not have a mandate, which also means he doesn't really have the support. The 30.2 uh, million votes, the 30.1 million votes, means that he really has to play things uh, politically conservative. He can't really go out and do all the things that he wants to do because if it fails, it's going to look really bad for him. And the race to the moon, again, we talked about the Soviet Union before and how they have uh, put the first rocket into space with Sputnik. They put the first man into space. However, uh, by 1969, we are the first country to put a man on the moon. And that was the big race. That was the big kind of in-your-face for the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, Kennedy does not get to see this uh, after he makes that promise in 1960. And now for the Berlin crisis. There are East Germans that are moving to West Berlin and then from there fleeing to other Western European countries. There are three million East Germans that are going to come across because they see the failings of communism. They are going to go to West Berlin and see the Western influence of rock and roll, blue jeans, all sorts of stuff, Elvis for example. They're going to go back and they're going to talk of the failings of communism. So they're going to flee. This is going to be known as a brain drain. You're going to have doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, they're all going to be leaving. Uh, and what the communists do not want is all those people leaving and then leaving them with nothing. So what they're going to do is build the Berlin Wall. In a sense, it's something that gets thrown up overnight and then fortified over time. It gets put around West Berlin and virtually ending the crisis. What this is going to do is stop East German immigration 
from East Berlin to West Berlin and then to Western Europe. This is going to be a symbol of oppression uh, with the graffiti. There is guard towers, lookout towers to make sure people do not get over top the wall. And it's just going to be uh, from 1961 to 1990 the symbol of communism and the oppression that comes along with it. Uh, it's going to fall in 1989, and in uh, October 3rd, 1990, we're going to have the reunification of Germany once the kind of Soviet Union falls and the rest of Eastern Europe uh, communism does end up falling. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.